pouvez lancer l'enregistrement comme ça maintenant. Maintenant, vous repartagez votre fichier avec le share screen. Et là, normalement, c'est supposé enregistrer l'ensemble de votre réunion. On ne sait pas trop ce que ça enregistre précisément. Mais là, dans tous les cas, ça enregistre de toute manière l'écran d'ordinateur. Donc, normalement, ça va bien. Oui, ça, il y a le Après, on peut couper cette jolie introduction. Et bon, alors. Merci. Merci monsieur. Mm. So, you know, I'm sorry for the delay. No problem. Some people were interested, but could not be there because I did get sick with so many people members. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to the second seminar. So, without further ado, I'll start. Oops, does it does it work? Yeah, it does. So, let me briefly recapitulate. Uh, on the contents of the first seminar. So, um, last time I mainly discussed the definitions and um, major features of polysynthesis. So, polysynthesis is extreme morphological complexity of verbs, to put it very Crudely, it actually can be understood as a constellation of several distinct phenomena, such as head marking and polypersonalism, so called lexical affixation, as well as various types of incorporation. And the most important thing is that. The phenomenon itself, the notion of polysynthesis it, itself, and the class of languages that it is supposed to define are internally internally heterogeneous and have fuzzy boundaries. And today we shall look more closely precisely at the cross-linguistic variation of polysynthesis along a number of parameters, some of which are listed on this slide. So, um, let's first just look at two more or less random examples. So this is Central Siberian Yupik. Uh, a verbal form with a root and a number of affixes. All of this means something like it turns out he or she wanted to go eat it, but something else happened or prevented prevented it. Um, this is another example from Western Apache and Athabascan language. Uh, a verbal form with a root and a special form and a number of prefixes. And all this means they usually play again. 
And you might see that it contains a number of morphemes with very opaque glosses. Don't ask me what thematic or classifier mean in this language. Anyway, it might be a bit more useful to juxtapose these examples of this on the same slide. And actually, the, my, my goal of presenting these examples, or I could, I could actually present more or less random examples from two more or less random languages usually considered polysynthetic. So my goal was just to show that two random examples from two random different languages um, simply show that that polysynthetic structures, structures which are called polysynthetic, can differ tremendously along lots of parameters. And um, we are in a position to ask if there is actually anything similar between these two or any other so-called polysynthetic languages beyond their having very long verbs. So polysynthetic languages differ widely along many parameters, both quantitative and qualitative. So it could be average or maximum number of morphemes per word, or uh, number and type of semantic features grammaticalized. These two are not the same, of course. Or, uh, for instance, number of paradigmatically opposed affixes in each slot. Or number of participants expressed by pronominal affixes. Type of arrangement of morphemes within the bird degree of morphophonological opacity, such as fusion, um, various changes of morphemes induced by context, um, other morphological phenomena, such as multiple exponents, for instance, or allomorphy, presence, productivity, and types of incorporation, because it not all polysynthetic languages have incorporation, and those that do have, have different types of, of it, and it can be more or less productive, etc. And there, of course, there can be other relevant parameters as well. So, somewhat surprisingly, there aren't in fact many comparative works which would be based on representative samples of polysynthetic languages and aim to map their diversity and parameterize their similarities and differences. Some early exam relatively early examples are worked by Fortescue and Drossard, but these are short papers. In fact, the overwhelming majority of important publications on polysynthetic languages such as, for instance, many articles by Marianne Methun, which are highly relevant, uh, and as well as most con contributions to volumes, including the Oxford Handbook of Polysynthesis, they all deal with just one language or several selected languages. Um, of course, there is a famous exception that is Mark Baker's The Polysynthesis Parameter, uh, which is a generative work. So it's it, it's not exactly it's not based on a representative and balanced sample, but still Baker is one of the of the practitioners of so-called generative typology, and he, he is a typologist. And his work is really comparative and based on, on 
a considerable lump number of languages. Another important uh, exception, which is probably less known at Baker's work, is a series of articles by Johanna Mattison, who has actually based her research on the topology of photosynthesis on a 75 language sample, which importantly includes not only a high number of languages that are traditionally considered polysynthetic, but also some languages that are not traditionally considered polysynthetic, such as Japanese or German. And this is this is useful. And mm, I'll base my today's exposition largely on Martinson's work, which I consider extremely important, even though it's not the final word. And it can be extended and in some ways revised. So the basic parameters of, of Mattison's topology are as follows. First, whether the verb stem can contain more than one lexical root. The terms she uses are compositional, slightly misleading, versus a fixal polysynthesis. The second parameter is the internal organization of the polysynthetic verb, that is scope ordered versus templatic. And the final parameter is the number of arguments that are indexed in the verb by phenomenal affixes ranging from polypersonal, when there are two or more, to a personal when there are actually none. And in the following, I'll discuss these parameters and some others as well in greater detail. Um, did I miss a question at some point? So let's start with compounding and incorporation. So the, the, the relevant types of compounding are of course of course verbal compounding, which which um, which means compounds involving at least one one verbal root and yielding verbs. So in this domain, one can, can distinguish between noun incorporation, which is of course the best known of all incorporation phenomena, it's subject to an enormous literature in all possible frameworks. And of course, noun incorporation is by no means limited to languages that are usually considered polysynthetic. But there is also adverb incorporation and verb incorporation or verb root serialization. And these three subtypes are sometimes co occur in one language and sometimes not. So, some examples. This is noun incorporation from Chukchi. Uh, and Chukchi and its relatives have extensive and quite productive noun incorporation, and they can um, they are outstanding in that they can incorporate not only just a single nominal root, but also um nominal roots with their dependence. So it's it's something like if, well, apparently a, a noun phrase that is incorporated, but, I th but in fact, it's rather a nominal compound. Later, we'll see that, that um, 
There is extensive nominal compounding in Chukchi as well. And so the whole compound is incorporated in the verb. And since Chukchi is also famous for its circumflexal inflectional morphology, you can see that this whole long incorporated complex is surrounded by two inflectional pieces. This is an example of adverb incorporation from being in Gunbok, an Australian language, where again and wrongly are incorporated into the verb, which also contains a nominal root incorporated. I cooked the wrong meat for them again. And this is an example of verb root serialization from Yimas. Um, and as you may see, um, that is the so-called sequential morphing between these verbal roots are uh, probably a vestige of some non-finite morphology uh, of the times when these were still um, separate clauses and not, not uh, a single verbal form. So as I said, more than one type of or incorporation can be present in a given language. On the other hand, many languages that are usually considered polysynthetic, such as, for instance, Navajo or Kariana, actually lack incorporation. And again, many languages that have incorporation are not usually considered polysynthetic. And here I give an example from modern Greek, which has adverb incorporation. Um, although it's probably not as productive and widespread as as incorporation in some of the languages that are traditionally considered polysynthetic, uh, still it exists. And the question of productivity is certainly important, but it would be a gross mistake to think that in Polysynthetic languages, affixation and incorporation are fully and 100% productive. It's not always the case. So, productivity is a very important, is a very important parameter. But one shouldn't be misled into thinking that polysynthetic languages are productive versus whereas non-polysynthetic languages are non-productive. It's, it's, it would be too simplistic. So that's probably all about compounding and, and incorporation. And now I'd like to turn to lexical affixation, which is much less straightforward and move around. So these lexical affixes, what Fortescue calls lexically heavy morphemes, and Madison calls non root bout morphemes but rather concrete meanings, what are they? First of all, they are bound morphemes that are unable to perform birds by themselves. They aren't incorporated roots because they are not roots. They don't occur without something which looks like a root. However, they express meanings that are similar to those that are encoded by roots or independent words in the same language, or at least in other languages, 
well, in, in the meta languages of linguistics, so to say. But if yeah, if the meta language of linguistics and it is English, then probably almost everything is expressed by words in English. So it's not a very good, a very good um, comparison is, but but still. Um and of course, while the clearest cases of lexical affixes are probably uncontroversial, the notion itself is certainly fuzzy and subject to critique. So Madison has tried to single out a number of semantic types of lexical affixes, such as uh, direction and position, body parts, classifiers, um, natural objects like an animals and plants, artifacts, um, things related to motion and manner, degree, temporality, that is, that doesn't mean tense, like present or future. It means things like yesterday, tomorrow, or something more, much more specific. Phasal, like begin, continue, or stop. Scale and focus. Reversative, like again, and quantification, and some others, if you wish. So, for example, Repecha, mm, a language isolate in Mexico, has a large number of lacks of locative suffixes with quite concrete meanings, such as he sat on the pay on the patio, in the street, inside the house, etc. And there are quite a bit of languages that have something similar. And actually, Madison herself writes that the most important definitive type of lexical affixes are lexical affixes expressing various types of locations. But of course, there are also other types. Quite a lot of languages have affixes describing body parts. And there has been some recent work about them. So for instance, in Salishan languages, there are quite a lot of body part suffixes, suffixes like this in Bellacula. Ak means hands, do something with hands or about hands or when a hand is involved in some way. And there are also suffixes for legs, other parts of the body. Um, and Eskimoan languages are famous for having lots of predicative or verbalizing suffixes that are similar in their meanings to to verbs, also to verbs of, of, of the same language, at least some of them. So that is, for instance, a, a suffix denoting possession, a suffix denoting eating something, cons consuming something, trying, being tired of doing something, asking somebody to do something, etc., etc. Probably they they go back to former verbs, but it but they have become suffixes. They don't occur independently anymore. In some languages, one can see that these lexical affixes actually express 
the bulk of the lexical content of some lexical elements. So in this word from from Nucha, Nult, the root is there only because it's structurally required. You can't have a word without that begins a word in this language must begin with a root. But this root doesn't doesn't have to have a meaning because at least in this case the meaning is expressed by the suffixes. So to live is to be together in the house. And the root is there only to to fill in the structural position and to hold this these these suffixes. And of course one might ask whether there are cases where these former suffixes with dummy roots get reanalyzed as new roots. It's probably possible. As, as I already have mentioned last time, Lexical affixes are also arguably present in some languages that are not considered polysynthetic. So why, for instance, why not consider, why not treat the locative prefixes of many European languages such as Lithuanian or German for that matter? as an example of lexical affixes. So for instance, here we clearly have locative prefixes. Also note the prefix par, which literally means home. So its meaning is very concrete. And these two are reversative, that is they, they uh, at least in, in combination with these verbs, of course, they are all quite polysemous. And uh, so they all have some kind of, spati of spatial meaning, but also have other types of meanings. And most of these meanings more or less fall into different domains specified by Matheson's typology of lexical affixes. Besides that, Lithuanian also has a more exotic affix. This ta here uh, on which I wrote a paper quite some time ago. It is a restrictive prefix meaning only, and it is it belongs to, to Madison's scalar or focus domain. And so far, so far, uh, for what I know, Lithuanian is the only non polysynthetic language that has an affixal, a verbal affix meaning only. There aren't many languages of this type, but so there is Lithuanian and two or three languages that are traditionally considered polysynthetic. So again, I don't mean that, it, that this makes Lithuanian polysynthetic. I only mean <clears throat> that if we discuss these properties normally associated with polysynthesis, we should also look at other languages as well and see whether uh, whether they are actually found in non-polysynthetic languages as well. So that's what Madison writes on European proverbs because of course she is very well aware of this problem. But unfortunately her solution isn't satisfactory. 
she writes that the qualitative difference between these local morphemes and non root bound morphemes in polysynthetic languages lies in their being lexicalized on their roots. But this, this, is, this isn't a good argument at all, I think, for two reasons. First, at least some of the local and non-local proverbs of the European languages are highly productive. And of course, as I already said, affix root combinations in many a polysynthetic language tend also to be not so productive and even lexicalized, and there is some literature on this. So productivity and degree of lexicalization isn't, isn't a very good parameter by which one can distinguish between polysynthetic and non-polysynthetic languages. At least it, it, it can't be the only parameter. So, um, in this connection, I'd like also to briefly talk about uh, the notion of productive non-inflectional concatenation that I have mentioned last time. Uh, it has been introduced by Willem de Rose as a special type of morphology, which is neither derivational nor inflectional, and apparently especially characteristic of polysynthetic languages. So according to De Rose, um, P and C, productive and reflectional concatenation, actually is similar to syntax in such features as productivity, recursivity, variable order, and ability to change categories. And let me draw your attention to recursivity and variable order. So De Rose provides examples from Central Siberian Yupik, a language he has extensively worked on. So it indeed it does show some recursive affixation. So in this, in example 13, we have two instances of the rogative suffix mean asking somebody to do something. So he asked him to go ask him to come in. Two instances of the same suffix in the same word form. Um, in some cases, we also see variable order of affixes, apparently without any difference in meaning. So here there is sensitive, sees doing something and causal, um, not causative, but causal, do something on account of something else. And they can occur in either order without an apparent difference in meaning. And so this is probably similar to adverbs, sometimes occurring in two different orders without an apparent difference in meaning, although we also know that the ordering of adverbs is sometimes quite strict. Um, anyway, one could ask to what extent these two examples are actually characteristic of Central Siberian Yupik first and polysynthetic languages in general second. And also we can, of course, find somewhat similar phenomena in, in the language that, that are languages that are usually not considered polysynthetic at all. So Slavic languages are famous for their prefix stacking. 
so-called superlexical prefixes extensively studied during the last two decades. And this really looks as a kind of productive non-reflection concatenation. So for instance, in Bulgarian, according, at least according to a paper by Vera Stratkova, who is a native speaker, Bulgarian allows variable order of the repetitive pre and the distributive vras without an apparent difference of, in meaning. And I finished selling it again to the very end is something that, well, a, a complex, a meaning of complexity that we would expect of, of polysynthetic languages, probably. Um, Russian even allows some prefix recursion. Pere pere pisevets to rewrite many times, to re rewrite, if you wish. Um, to me, it's, well, of course, it's, it's not something that I would say every day, but it's attested in Google. And if there are speakers who are able to construct and pause it, then why not? Anyway, the, the, the very point of this type of morphology of being productive is that in, it can form purely ad hoc forms that one has, need not ever uh, encountered before. So anyway, the notion of productive non-inflection concatenation, in my view, is very useful for morphological theory and morphological typology in general, at least for the reason that it's a type of morphology that can't be, um, that doesn't fit well into the dichotomy between inflection and derivation. However, um considering it a part of the definition of polysynthesis as de Rose tries try to do in his paper is probably not 100 percent correct because at least such characteristics as recursion and variable order of affixes appear to be quite exceptional. They are probably really attested in the Eskimo languages, but Eskimo languages are special. In that their morphology really does seem to allow more than, than even other polysynthetic morphology allows. So it would be it would be a mistake, I think, to expect to find affix recursion and variable ordering in many languages traditionally considered polysynthetic. So this actually brings us to the question of internal organization and affix ordering. In linguistic theory and morphological typology, it is um, a distinction is usually made between so-called layered organization that is ordering of elements determined by their mutual semantic scope and templatic organization, which is rigid and often opaque with no meaningful ordering. And this is more or less well known from, from the literature on morphological typology, not necessarily having to do with polysynthesis at all. And importantly, of course, many languages show elements of both types of organization. 
in different subparts of their morphology. Um, so again, Central Alaskan, again, an Eskimo language is Central, Central Alaskan Yupik has scope based affixation like this. You add affixes in the order of their semantic composition. And each next affix, each following affix takes the pre preceding string in its scope. But you have more or less the same thing with prefix taking in Bulgarian, give, distribute, redistribute, redistribute a little, redistribute little by little completely. Simply a mirror image, if you wish. Um, probably the most characteristic hallmark of scope based ordering is of cases when affixes can attach in opposite orders with a clear difference in meaning. So in 19A from Southern Sierra Milwalk, that is first a causative, and then it's probably not an affix, but uh, a root. I don't remember. It's closed, closed, ready. Anyway, so first causative and then ready means he is ready to make him go home. But you can also attach these affixes in the opposite order, and the meaning is different. Because in this case, first comes being ready to go home, and then the cause of his making him ready to go home. But it's not very frequent that you find such nice pairs of examples. By contrast, templated morphology is characterized by a rigid and opaque and often, if you wish, counterintuitive affix ordering, which is motivated by some complex historical processes, probably no longer really discernible. A good example is cat a moribund Genesian language from Siberia, where verbs contain both derivational and inflection morphemes, and they don't follow each other in any nice order. They are just intertwined. So there are certain, certain, um, disjoint positions for derivation for more lexical more derivational morphemes like verbal root and incorporated elements or proverbs and a number of intertwined positions from for grammatical morphemes such as phenomenal indexes and tense and their ordering can vary between different classes of verbs and it's all highly complex, and this order cannot be explained by, by scope or anything, anything meaningful, so to say. I'm not going to comment on this on this table too too much. It just shows that that. If we look at some of the parameters that I have discussed so far, we find that most of the logically possible classes actually are manifested in, in languages. So you can find uh, languages with noun incorporation and verb root serialization with templatic as well as layered morphology or both etc. And so 
Matesan um, distinguishes between several subtypes of polysynthetic languages. based on the clustering of these properties. Now let me turn to participant indexing and you know, I'm actually wondering how much time do, do we still have given that we started late? Yeah. So okay. Okay. No. Okay. Good. So participant indexing. So on the one hand the personalism that is indexing of at least two arguments by bound pronominals in the verb or head marking known from work by Johanna Nichols is wrought into some definitions of polysynthesis as a, as a defining feature. So for instance, Fortescue in his definition of core polysynthetic languages, which I have which I quoted last time, writes that a core polysynthetic language must display whole mm -hmm. phrases, that is, be able to represent a whole clause, including all bound core pronominals by a single verb. However, this parameter can also and probably should be viewed as a variable. So we find that personal indexing in some languages such as Yorakare, for instance, in Bolivia, where three participants of a three argument verb are indexed, we find bipersonal indexing as in Kumbalang in a Gunwingran language, where the subject and the recipient of give are indexed, but the theme, the money here, isn't indexed. There are, but there are also languages which show quite a lot of polysynthetic style morphology, but don't actually index even two participants. So Sahaptian languages have quite complex morphology, but only they normally index only one participant. And there are even languages like Autu in New Guinea, which show quite a lot of incorporation and lexical affixation and very long verbs, so they are polysynthetic by all measures, but they don't index any participants at all. Is this, should this be a reason to exclude them from consideration? Probably not. So, on the other hand, if we look at the cross-linguistic distribution of polypersonalism, for instance, in walls, we find that, in fact, indexing of both the agent and the patient of a transitive verb is the most cross-linguistically widespread pattern in the languages of the world. It's <coughs> by no means limited to to the so-called polysynthetic languages. You find, and if you look for tripersonal indexing, which is much rarer, for instance, you find it in Basque, which isn't, which doesn't have any other features associated with polysynthesis. 
You also find it in Macedonian, for instance, which with its located proverbs is probably more polysynthetic than Bosque. So, even though prototypical canonical polysynthetic languages indeed have polypersonal head marking morphology, it's as I agree with Fortescue that whereas head marking is essentially a matter of inflection. Polysynthesis is also, also contains an essential derivational, lexical, if you wish, component. And probably Matheson is right in foregrounding this derivational lexical component and treating the personalism and head marking as a variable rather than part of the definition. Let us also briefly look at at the few which is known or rather hypothesized about the diachrony of polysynthesis. Of course, most polysynthetic languages do not have any documented historical records, and therefore the only way to glance into their history is by means of reconstruction, both internal and comparative. If there is anything to compare them with, because many polysynthetic languages are language isolates on top of on top of that. So Fortescue proposes to distinguish between older and newer polysynthesis on the basis of a number of parameters, such as whether, uh, whether lexical sources of affixes are transparent or not, whether incorporated morphemes can bear any kind of independent stress, whether the ordering of elements is more meaningful or rather opaque, like the entangled mm -hmm. ordering of derivational and infection morphemes in cat, whether there is success evidence for successive layering of different types of affixes, fossilization mm -hmm. and lexicalization, or uh, one could probably add degrees of morphophonological opacity versus transparency to this list. And according to Fortescue, some of the polysynthetic languages, for instance, Chukchi, appear to, to be, well, I'd rather put it a diff different way, some polysynthetic structures in some languages such as, for instance, in Chukchi, appear to be younger than others. Then, according to Fortescue, Eskimoan has older polysynthesis, versus Chukchi has newer polysynthesis. Um, Fortescue also considers possible pathways into polysynthesis. And since for him, head marking is part of the definition, certainly he writes that embedding in a larger geographical region where head marking is already dominant is a prerequisite for the emergence of polysynthesis. And further, he distinguishes three main pathways into polysynthesis depending on whether are uh, the languages start this development already having such properties as, for instance, productive verbalizing affixes, but little 
or no compounding versus lots of compounding but no productive verbalizing affixes or verb serialization in a fixed order that facilitates univerbation. And he gives this sort of picture showing these, these pathways for a number of languages. And one can and probably should also ask a question about the possibility of so-called abrupt rise of polysynthesis-like patterns due to univerbation or prosodic integrate, phonological and prosodic integration of structures that can be considered to be analytic or clitic at, at some previous stage. And here, probably somewhat daringly, I'd like to mention French. So written French is clearly an analytic language, but spoken French probably isn't already. And there have been quite some literature on, on the differences between written and spoken French. And some claims that spoken French is actually close to, to polysynthesis in some ways. I wouldn't, I don't want to ignite a discussion of this because I'm not, not really an expert, although early in my career I dared to, to have a conference paper as exactly on, on, on the polysynthetic nature of spoken French. But anyway, it is probably a worthwhile uh, endeavor to look at some better known languages from this standpoint. And there is also some work on modern Greek and spoken Spanish, for instance, which claim that these languages are, if addressed without, without orthogra orthography-based preconceptions, <clears throat> turn out to be close to, to polysynthesis. And I th also think that, for example, Bal Balkan Slavic, such as Macedonian, most importantly, could also be be integrated into this into this uh, line of research. So, yeah, or the synthesis beyond verbs. So, just very quickly. Mm. Again, to repeat a quotation that I gave last time, Marianne Mithun writes that polysynthetic languages show a tendency to develop their morphological complexity primarily within verbs. And of course, all definitions of polysynthesis are centered around verbs. Uh, and by contrast, nominal morphology in polysynthetic languages has often been believed to be impoverished. Uh, however, in fact, this is not always the case. So again, Martison has investigated this question and published a paper on nominal complexity. And she concludes that although nominal complexity is independent of the morphological type of language in principle, it's in fact most common in polysynthetic languages. So we find polysynthetic nouns in Tariana, which also has polysynthetic verbs. We find extensive incorporation 
in Chukchi nouns, just as extensive as in Chukchi verbs. And actually, the, the, the whole morphological pattern is, is largely the same with uh, everything lexical stick together, surrounded by, by circumflexal inflection markers. In this case, the committed. Um, and in the Eskimo languages, we can actually say that their polysynthetic morphology is simply insensitive to, to the word class because the word class is determined by the last morphing. You can build a very long verb and then turn it into a participle and that will be a, a nominal you can build a very long nominal and then verbalize it, verbalize it, and then nominalize it again, and even verbalize it again, as in this example. So this type of morphology is simply not limited to verbs. It's, it doesn't care whether you are a noun or a verb. Although Eskimo languages robustly distinguish between nominals and verbs on all levels. And of course, you find certain patterns of this type also in non polysynthetic languages, although in Lithuanian it's much more limited. But in German, you have extensive and very productive compounding. Um, and well, imagine that, imagine a German prime that has German style extensive compounding and productive verbalization affixes that could apply to anything. Imagine being able to form a verb of this Lieblings ex Hauptstadt bewohner. This could probably lead to, to a well-behaved polysynthetic language. Yes. So that X Hauptstadt belongs together more closely. And if you say Lutheran's X Hauptstadt bewohner, Hauptstadt bewohner, so the inhabitant of the Hauptstadt of those two together, and it's a form of No. But actually this, this difference in stress pattern, it well, it also bears on the question that I tackled last time about what what is a word actually in morphosyntactic as well as prosodic prosodic terms. Mm -hmm. And of course this this question is also is also of paramount importance to 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 the discussion of these of whether European languages tend or not or don't tend to be polysynthetic. Because it all the 
in some way it, it depends on how you define the word and whether it's a meaningful um, unit in these languages at all. So to conclude today's um, lecture, of course, as I think I have shown also last time, polysynthesis is an evasive and a vague notion. But is it completely useless and has to be has to be thrown away? I think it depends on one's point of view. Because if one wishes to formulate language universals of implicative type, like if a language L is polysynthetic, then this won't work, unfortunately, at least as, as far as current state of our knowledge allows me to, to say. However, if one wishes to map and investigate the blank spots of linguistic diversity, then the notion of polysynthesis is already not so useless. Because if you're fascinated by something so as strange and exotic and um, evasive as polysynthesis, you have a chance to study some very interesting things. So polysynthetic languages are highly variable and in many respects exceptional. And both their variation and their exceptionality offer us linguists and linguistics quite a lot of unique treasures of empirical facts and testing grounds for hypothesis and methods. And given that most polysynthetic languages that there still are, given that they are in danger to different degrees, it's our responsibility of linguists to avail ourselves of these treasures before it's actually too late. Um, and next time, I'll speak more about the languages I have worked with myself. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Are there any questions? <clears throat> I was wondering why that should be or could be might be a criterion in any way. Because so there's not is that variable really? in the other example? Because for instance your French example. I think in, in French it's striking that <laughs> the critics have to be in a particular order and that's what makes it look that's what makes it look um, more polysynthetic because it looks like a copy you have a word, a complex word with <laughs> different slots that are dedicated to particular elements. But there, if you have if you then you know modify the order, then it looks more analytic, doesn't it? No. Thank you, Katarina. I think it's a very relevant question. And actually, I think well, actually, to, to, to put it shortly, I mm, there is of course some simplification in my presentation of De Rosa's arguments. Um 
because well i don't i i don't want to to say that he doesn't distinguish between variable affix order that bears on meaning and that which doesn't of course he does and actually i'm i'm more or less sure that that in this in this particular case in example 14 um uh, we don't see a semantic difference because because of the particular meanings that are that are um, involved although I'm, I'm not at all an expert to to fully judge about it but anyway a really variable affix order when several permutations of affixes are available all of them being grammatical and meaning the same, this is an extremely rare and exceptional phenomenon. And I dare say that it's quite exceptional also for Eskimo languages, exactly because their affix order is largely scope-based. And if it's code based, then it makes a diff normally makes a difference in which order you attach affixes because there is different semantic scope. Um, and one also has to bear in mind that in many cases where affix order is technically rigid meaning that you can't you can't have things like uh, like this if you have two affixes they always come in a fixed order but many cases of this are still based on scope when for instance you have aspect then tense and then mood in this order and this order corresponds to the semantic scope because mood scopes of a tense and tense scopes of an aspect. And um, actually, for what I know, this type of examples where, where, where you can really change the order of a pair of affixes and, and have different different interpretations different iconic interpretations it's 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 also rare uh, next time I'll show a similar pair of examples of examples from Bessercassian but they are both elicited and they aren't actually characteristic of of the language so you that you can pressure your native speakers to to give you nice things like that but that's not necessarily how they <clears throat> want to speak. So even in scope-based, in languages where order affects is scope-based, rigid order is rather the norm, I think. Just a clarification about um, things. Was the Jupiter example on this installment? Yeah. Um, what would be the the root? Yeah. The, the meaning of the root. Yeah. So in all these three cases the roots are the nominals so the the root is yeah I, I should have marked the root of course so the the root is the root in Eskimo languages the root always comes first and in this case the these are all verbalizing affixes that attach to to nominal roots and turn them into verbs 
so in some way, in some way, it's it's similar to non-incorporation, and some scholars, such as, for instance, Gerald Sadok and Marianne Methune, treat these examples as non-incorporation. But there is an important difference with canonical non-incorporation found in, I don't know, in Mahawk, because none of these verbalizing elements can occur as roots as independent roots, they can't occur in the first position. But it's again, it's it's like a an interesting and somewhat idiosyncratic property of these languages that they have roots in the first position and only in the first position. So they they can't have compounding and, and incorporation by definition because there was just one position for the root. So everything else, however long it is and whichever meanings it expresses are affixes. Just, well, by definition, by the, the, the structural rules of the language. Thank you again, Peter. And next time I will come again. Thank you. Excuse me. And without any technical issues, I'm here. Let's hope. So.